There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am, third year in a row with Sean the Book Maniac's Besties and Worsties of 2019. Last time I went on so long that I had to split it up over into two videos and I was too drunk by the end that you might as well have skipped part two. So I have just started my first beverage of the evening and let's get going. <laughs> <laughs> the titles are listed, but I alphabetize by author so that you don't know what book gets which prize. You have to watch the video. So manipulative. First of all, the best opening line or paragraph. That goes to an Irish novel that I quite enjoyed about halfway through 2019 called Leonard and Hungry Paul by Ronan Hessian. And here's the opening paragraph. Leonard was raised by his mother alone with cheerfully concealed difficulty. His father having died... Okay, and I'm going to try to get through the opening line without cracking up. This is take three. Leonard was raised by his mother alone with cheerfully concealed difficulty. His father having died tragically during childbirth. Though she was not by nature the soldiering type, she taught him to look at life as a daisy chain of small events, each of which could be made manageable in its own way. She was a person for whom kindness was a very ordinary thing, who believed that the only acceptable excuse for not having a bird feeder in the back garden was that you had one in the front garden. The next award is for sexiest writing or scene, and I have chosen two. One, and this will be the longest quote I read, and then there's only two, maybe three more that are very short quotes after this. But please indulge me for the first one. And that is from the South African gay novel by S.J. Nudia, The Third Reel. The protagonist, Etienne, is a gay white South African man, newly arrived in London, and uh, he's just had his first sexual encounter with a man. And that particular man lived in a church because that particular young man was a campanologist, a bell master. Someone, he, he describes it as someone who knows bells, who fixes and tunes them, and sometimes rings them. So he actually lives in the tower where the bell is in this church. Kind of reminds me of an experience I had in London back in the mid 80s, but we don't have time for that. You can find that kind of information on my other pay channel. <laughs> this is after Etienne has left this guy's church, this guy's house, and he's walking home with that just got laid glow. And I just love this passage. Etienne exits the church, inhales the traffic fumes. Like the sulfuric smoke, he thinks, of Blake's heavenly fires. Further down the street, he realizes, Frank hasn't rung the bells. Neither last night nor this morning. And it is Sunday, after all. Not much of a bell master, our Frank. Lying there, spread-eagled, while the sun draws musk from his body's creases. The bells motionless. Wouldn't it be simpler to mechanize the bells, Etienne wonders? It is the 80s, after all. A bell ringer, nevertheless, with the loveliest round buttocks of all bell ringers. When a shockwave of sound hits Etienne from behind, he stops. It is pure, like a bird singing for the first time. He turns around. The sound is emanating from the sun, which is shining fiercely behind the tower. Is Frank looking down at him while doing the ringing? Etienne smiles, lifts his hand in a blind salute, fist clenched. He walks further. A campanologist, he says out loud in the wind, shaking his head. The sun warms his shoulder blades. The bells keep ringing. Is this the kind of peeling that might once have welcomed a king back to London after a hunt in the countryside? An image appears in his mind's eye. A procession of coaches entering the city, and behind them, horse-drawn carriages stacked with deer, slick with blood, horns interlocked like a primitive shelter of branches. He closes his eyes, smiles as he walks. The bells keep sounding. At Vauxhall Station, he turns and passes underneath the tracks, then turns right. He turns left in Vauxhall Grove, walks down to Bonington Square. The bell's rhythm is slowing in the distance. He opens number 52's front door, takes the stairs to the top. One by one, the bells fall silent. Morning sun is pouring into his room. With his eyes fixed on the skylight, 
trying to recall if the tower can be seen from the roof, he crashes into his drum kit. Fuck, he says in Afrikaans, silencing a resonating cymbal with his hand. He undresses in front of the mirror, looking at his new body. It might look like his old body, but every cell has been displaced. Silvery blood is pumping through his veins. There are bruises on his chest. But when he rubs them, they come off. Bell suit. His skin is excited by the mirror's touch. Even when he almost touches it, his nerves are picking up the slightest distortions in the air. His old flesh has had to yield to something harder, bronze-like, something that can be polished to a cold sheen. He is ready for the new city. His body is a radar, his skin a new country, his heart a shiny machine. And then literally one sentence from this 1936 novel, Begin Again by Ursula Orange, which I absolutely loved. I will put a link to my full review down below. And uh, this is a young man and a young woman. They're just getting acquainted. They haven't so much as kissed. They just met earlier that day and they're gone for a drive in his car. And then they pull over at the side of the road. The young man had let the young lady drive for a while. And then she said, no, I want you to drive again. So then this sentence. Quite a pleasant little business ensued of trying to crawl over and change places without getting out of the car. And now, the award for the unsexiest writing or scene, and that goes to Ocean Vong for On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. I'm literally going to read you three sentences scattered between pages 110 and 111. If you saw my review with Dan of the Weird Book Book Club, you will have heard these before. Sentence number one. Under the covers, we made friction of each other and fiction of everything else. Sentence number two. I drove my face into him, as if into a climate, the autobiography of a season. And finally, surfacing from the sheets, his face shone through the wet mask we made of our scavenge. The next award is for Best Cover, and this was difficult. But I have chosen Celestial Bodies by Joka Alharti, which won the International Man Booker Prize Award. And there is so much to recommend this book beyond its cover, but I think this cover illustration is just gorgeous. And I will link to my full review below. I have a new award this year. This is the Most Epic Literary Prize Fail. This is a very special award, so just allow me to, to patch in a, a much more exalted uh, uh, announcer. We've operated as a jury on the basis of consensus. Today, we tried voting. Didn't work. We found that there were two, not that we couldn't let go of, but that we desperately wanted to win this year's prize. So we're awarding the prize jointly to both of them. Without further ado, the co-recipients, the co-winners of this year's most epic literary prize fail are the Booker Prize 2019 and the Nobel Prize for Literature 20, maybe 18. The one with that asshole German guy. Next, a book I wish I had bailed on. There were many contenders, and I have gone with J.L. Carr's debut novel from 1964, A Day in Summer. I buddy read this with Heidi of My Reading Life, and this was just awful. There were so many first novel mistakes, and it started out promisingly, but the more we got into it, it was so fucking sexist. Everybody was an asshole. All the women were sluts or bitches that I could barely finish. Now, J.L. Carr wrote one of my favorite novels near the end of his life, A Month in the Country. And there are many of the themes that you can trace back to this, but he seemed to have shed a lot of clumsy novelistic fails, but also his sexism. I don't remember encountering anything sexist in A Month in the Country, but this was absolute putrid garbage. Favorite character? I've gone with 
Amar, the son in Fatima Farheen Mirza's novel from 2018, A Place for Us. I loved that character so much. I just, oh, he was such a beautiful person and he was so screwed up and <laughs> such a beautiful heart and he was heartbroken, very young, and his family didn't really understand him. And Mirza renders his character on the page with such poignancy that I think of him every day. Amar, are you okay? I loved him. And next is the most hated character. And just so that everybody understands, when I say most hated character, I don't mean a villain or a dark character in the novel. That's boring. Yes, I hated Dracula or whatever. You know what I mean? That's stupid. I mean a character that the author probably intended people to like or to at least experience in a nuanced way that I absolutely loathe. And hands down, that goes to the same novel that I just read the opening sexy scene from, S.J. Nudia's the, the Third Reel. I cannot recommend this book. I ended up pretty much hating this book. And in large part, that was due to the boyfriend that Etienne lands, that Etienne gets. And that boyfriend's name is Axel. Axel is a installation artist but he works by day as a nurse in a terminal pediatric ward. And the installation that he's working on for much of this novel, one night, and this is a spoiler, but you don't want to read this book anyway. <laughs> Just read the first chapter. Axel takes Etienne and they sneak into the, to the ward where the terminally ill children are, babies, most of them, in the dark, in the middle of the night, and they shave hair off of these dying children which Axel is planning to use in an inst art installation. <sighs> and everything about him was that creepy. And the thing that drove me crazy, so again, spoiler, was that Etienne, this sweet South African guy who started out with that openness to sexuality, he never gives up on this guy. It just, like, I don't want to read about this fucking doofus who's shaving dying children for art. Oh my God. <laughs> Calm down, Sean. Next is the puke-worthiest paragraph, and again, poor Ocean Vuong. I loved his book of poetry, and this book is not entirely crap, but there's so much crap in this book, and definitely the puke-worthiest paragraph that I read in 2019 comes from On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. Again, this is relating to this young protagonist exploring his sexuality with a guy that's really bad for him. We did what we had seen in porn. I wrapped my free arm around his neck, my mouth searching and taking any part of Trevor that was closest, and he did the same, pressing his nose into the crook of my neck, his tongue, his tongues, and his arms hot along their tense muscles, reminded me of the neighbor's house on Franklin Avenue the morning after it burned. I had lifted a piece of window frame, still warm from the wreck, my fingers digging into the soft wood, damp from the hydrant the way I now dug into Trevor's bicep. <laughs> I thought I heard the hiss of steam coming off him, but it was only October slashing outside, wind making a lexicon of the leaves. <sighs> a best conclusion to a novel. I'm not going to read you anything. I'm just going to very briefly describe. I'm looking at the time here. One is this wonderful novella that I read this year, Yuko Tsushima's Child of Fortune, translated from the Japanese by the wonderful translator and sadly recently departed, Geraldine Harcourt. And this novel is about a single mother and her daughter is a teenager and the protagonist, the mother, she's just a bit of a mess. And I loved her so much. And at the end of this novel, um, She's such a mess that the daughter is living with the much more upright sister and her husband a few blocks away, and the main character here, she has alcohol issues and she has trouble in all areas of her life, especially with the men in her life, including the, her daughter's father. And at the end, there is a scene where she stands up for herself to some of the men in her life in a way that was just like this this wondrously nuanced, deep, feminist moment that I absolutely loved. And then she wanders out of the bar, and I'm not going to describe it in any way. And she has this seemingly unrelated, casual encounter with strangers outside on the street. And it was like the most pitch-perfect ending. I love 
stories that end that way where it seems like it's not about anything but it resonates in such a fabulously throbbing way with the main story it was the perfect ending you must try this book and also i just recently read rowan hiseo buchanan starling days and it has a really emotionally powerful ending and all i'll say is that the main couple are on the verge of a breakup and then something happens at the very end and it just wow when you try this don't give up till you get to the very end don't bail imagine me saying that <laughs> the most extreme bail this was a welsh novel published i believe this year or last year most and thomas and the big grave by richard williams and i was really looking forward to it i don't have it anymore i've given it away but i bailed before i got to the bottom of page one the writing was that bad so that's my most extreme bail maybe of my life <laughs> winning <laughs> favorite short story this was difficult there it's so much great short fiction i read a lot more short stories this year than last year but i am giving this to a story by curtis sittenfeld that was anthologized in the best american short stories 2018 edited by roxanne gay and it's called the prairie wife and that story i'm going to put a link not only to the book where you can read it but also a link to the new yorker magazine where in one of their podcasts curtis sittenfeld reads this story you can listen to her read it and it is going to inflame all of your queer sensibilities it's fantastic honorable mention for this one to the opening story of amanda O'Callaghan's collection, This Taste for Silence, A Widow's Snow. I absolutely love that one as well. The most surprising bail. I bailed on an Anthony Trollope novel this year during Victober. The second one of his, um, what's it called? Parliament series. His, uh, I've just blanked on the name. What do you call that? Can You Forgive Her? And then Phineas Finn, the Palliser series. Phineas Finn, it was mind-numbingly boring. I'm interested in politics, but this was about, this was so much about politics and the characters who were, the politicians were as dull as ditch water. And what makes a Trollope novel come to life is, is his vibrant female characters, and there weren't any. Cora, Lady Cora from, can you forgive her? She walks on, on one page, and she barely spoke a line. And then she walks off, and... Uh, the other main female character was boring too, so I just gave up. I was I was shocked. Next is the award for the most moving passenger scene, and I have two winners for this as well. Again, I'm not going to read anything. But one is from Denton Welch's final novel, A Voice Through a Cloud. This is an autobiographical novel about Denton Welch being severely injured in a bicycle car accident in his mid to late 20s and about his recovery his physical recovery from that and there is a scene near the end where he is in a kind of a halfway house where they have a staff of nurses but he's got his own room and he's taking more and more care of himself he's getting his mobility back very gradually and a relative of his lives across the river like not very far but for him he decides that he's going to walk to visit her unaided and that was such a feat an accomplishment it was actually foolhardy it was beyond what he was really capable of but he wants to do it for himself and the description of that walk just ripped me to shreds and also so much of this this was one of my top reads of the year this is the second volume in the Alberta trilogy by Cora Sandell. This one is called Alberta and Freedom. And there is a scene, I could pick so many scenes that just were really deeply moving from this novel, translated from the Norwegian by Elizabeth Rokan. What an amazing translation. But the one where she is living alone, her friends seem to be away, she's almost out of money, she's living in such a rat infested like just a terrible place and has almost no way of making any money and she's just in such a desperate place in her life and she remembers that she wants to be a writer 
and just that description of her thinking, you know, I could write a few articles and I'd get enough money to buy some bread and not die. Just beautifully told. Uh, okay, shut up, Sean. You're going to st start crying into your beer here. But yeah, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Next is the most surprising scene, and I will just allude to these briefly to stay on time. My top read of the year, and one of the best books I've read in my life, Edward P. Jones's novel, The Known World. This is about slavery in America. I will link to my full review. And there is a scene here about a freed slave, and the only way a freed slave can prove that he's a freed slave is with the one copy of a handwritten document that he or she must carry on their person at all times. And what happens with one particular character to do with that vital piece of paper just destroyed me. And it was just so shocking in a heart-wrenching way. Oh my god. Another top read of the year, very close. This is definitely within the top 20 novels I've ever read and within the top three or four that I've read this year. Anna Burns' Milkman. And there is a scene here where the protagonist during the, I was going to say war-torn, it's not war-torn, it's um, the, during the time of troubles with the paramilitary and all of the, the rebels and the police and it, there's so much violence and killing and she walks through one of the sites that's bombed continuously. If memory serves, it's a graveyard or near a graveyard, but anyway, she finds the body parts of a cat and she carries one of those body parts. It's a very significant place in the entire novel, but that scene, it was so strange and strangely beautiful that I will never forget it. Next is the goofiest, bestest quote of the year. This is from Barbara Pym's novel, An Unsuitable Attachment, one of the last novels published in her lifetime, but which, if memory serves, she had been writing much earlier in her life. The conversation between co-workers. Oh, and before I begin, what I love about Barbara Pym is how much humor is embedded in her adverbs and adverb phrases. So if you can, pay attention to that. There's explosions of hilarity in so many of her adverbs. Mother is a spiritualist, you know, he said to Ayante. And somehow that doesn't seem to make our Christmas a particularly jolly one. I suppose preoccupation with those who have uh, died isn't quite in accordance with the spirit of Christmas, said Ayante tentatively. No, and our relations and friends who have passed over seem to be a particularly dreary bunch. Perhaps it's the fault of the medium. She's a Miss Stylish and lives in Balham. Not very promising, you'll agree, said Mervyn sourly. Iante never knew how to talk to him when he was in this sort of mood. She felt she could have done better than she did with her next remark. Balham, she said, thoughtful yet desperate. That's on the northern line, isn't it? The next award is the book I am most likely to reread the soonest. Hands down, that is Milkman by Anna Burns. I can't stop thinking about this novel. Next, The Bail I am most likely to try again. And that is one of the Faber stories. Alan Bennett's The Shielding of Mrs. Forbes. Because I got scolded so royally and I used the term consciously by two toilet check because I bailed I thought it was the writing was terrible and I couldn't finish it and he said you are completely insane you must reread it so I will two tight lit track I will uh, popular uh, 2019 books I didn't hate but didn't see what all the fuss was about and I don't have this book anymore because I really didn't see what the fuss was about and I've already gotten rid of it and that is happiness by Aminata Forna I just thought the characters were so deadened, especially to each other, that I, I just felt nothing as I was reading it. They had some interesting stuff, but I felt like I was reading a book-length New Yorker article about foxes and whatnot. The characters were flat and dull. The most disappointing read of 2019, there were at least a dozen contenders, but I'm going with my recency bias. Mattery Vijay's The Far Field. This was such a devastating disappointment to me. It's just an awful book, and I have a full review to prove that, if you're so inclined to check it out. The most surprising five-star read was Ohio by Stephen Markley. I love this book, and there were such serious flaws, but try as I might, I couldn't budge myself off of five stars. Again, I have a full review. 
My favorite read published in 2019 is Shut Up, Your Pretty by Teya Mutanji. My review of that will probably go up before this one does, or if not, shortly thereafter. It's a collection of linked short stories by a Congo-Canadian writer that I really, really loved. It's the only five-star read I have of any book published in 2019. And no surprise here, my worst read published in 2019... Now, there are things to really admire about this, but the things that I hated just have bugged me all year since I finished it. It's just awful. I mean, a, a book that has this many terrible things in it is an awful book, despite other moments of being briefly gorgeous. So yeah, the worst book I read this year. Hands down. Oh my god. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay, we're going to redo. <laughs> we're going to redo it. Uh the best title. You know what? I filmed this earlier and said I had hunted high and low in my apartment and couldn't find the book. And now that I look at this terribly messy pile of books that I pulled off my shelves for this video. There it is at the bottom. I had pulled it off the shelves earlier today and had forgotten it and then spent 20 freaking minutes or more looking for it again and didn't find it. So here it is again. The best title. Father may be an elephant and mother only a small basket but dot 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 by Gogol Shyamala with about eight or nine translators which I will list in the show notes as well as links to not only my full review of this wonderful collection of short stories from Dalit Telugu culture, but also my book haul video where I talk about this book only. All right, that's it. Thank you so much. Have a great, ha happy new year and to all a good night. <laughs>